What we are doing in biomimicry, we are trying to learn from nature. When we face complex problems in engineering, what mechanisms are out there that we can borrow for solutions? That was the voice of Dr. Nune Malkoumian. She's a senior lecturer in the School of Civil, Environmental and Mining Engineering at the University of Adelaide. And her research journey is one of true imagination and innovation. Civil engineering is like a form of art. Mm. And I always tell to my students, you are artists. <laughs> <laughs> you just happen to know maths. <laughs> but you must be artist first. You must have imagination. Hi, I'm Professor Andy Lowe. And today I'll be exploring how one researcher's passion for biomimicry and sensor technology has the potential to revolutionise some of our biggest industries on Earth and in space. Join me as I learn about WASP-inspired space tech, buildings that breathe, and how we can spot structural disasters before they even happen. This is the Discovery Pod. New name Malkumian. Welcome to the Discovery Pod. Hi, Andy. Thank you. <laughs> so you're senior lecturer in the School of Civil, Environmental and Mining Engineering at the University of Adelaide. And your specialist area is kind of biomimicry and sensors. So what is biomimicry? Uh, biomimicry is actually a very exciting area of research. What we are doing in biomimicry, when we face complex problems in engineering, we turn to nature for solutions. So we are looking at how nature has addressed the issues that we are facing. For example, building efficient buildings or breathing of uh, animals, insects and plants. So drilling, for example, wood like wasps do. So we are looking at those, and then we are borrowing those solutions and translating them into engineering solutions for us. Yeah. And that's, that's quite a complex pro uh, process, actually. We cannot take it and turn into engineering in a straightforward way. We have to do scaling. We have to come up with solutions, with materials. So that's a very, very interesting area. <laughs> so you're using the millions of years of evolution in exactly. natural systems and then fast-tracking those into engineering Absolutely. solutions. Yes. So it doesn't take you a million years to come up with your engineering <laughs> solutions. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> so give us some examples. Give us a, a good example of kind of biomimicry and how that's developed and applied and what kind of problems yes. you might apply biomimicry to? Yeah, maybe I start discussion with the swarm robotics mm. because it is more advanced area of biomimicry. So what swarm of robotics does, it takes the behavior of insects and writes an algorithm duplicating that. And then we have a group of robots who are communicating together like the swarm of bees or ants or other insects do. And by that, we assign them tasks, and then they start doing these tasks in groups. Mm. This is used, for example, in rescue missions. So there are small robots who can work coordinatedly together, and they can do rescue tasks. At the moment, we are working on applying swarm robotics into mining activities and into construction. Both we are looking at for off-world applications on other planets, on the moon. NASA has confirmed traces of water and ice on the moon, raising hopes for lunar exploration. The bigger reason why NASA wants to go back to the moon, actually needs to go back to the moon to find water, is as a stepping stone for future manned missions to Mars. Some out of this world news from Canberra this morning. Australia's space agency has partnered with NASA on a future mission to the moon. This is lunar history for Australia. We're going to see Australian businesses, researchers, design, build a, a rover that's going to go to the moon and do some interesting science. By far the most exciting time to be working in space in Australia. Probably since the 60s, since before I was ever involved. So in, in mining applications and rescue operations, what's the advantage of having you know, a number of smaller robots rather than a, a larger robot? In this particular case that we are working for off-world mining, and construction, obviously we cannot have people there at the beginning. We need to have automated machines who can do the work. The other thing that we are limited with is how much equipment we can shift to Moon or Mars. So we are very limited with weight, 
of things we can move. And if you have ever had a chance to see mining machinery, they are huge, absolutely mm -hmm. huge and heavy. So it's impossible to move them. And also it will allow us to do more targeted mining and be kinder to the environment. Hopefully that will come back to Earth as well and we have more <laughs> environmentally friendly mining. Maybe we should try it first here. But, you know, so <laughs> you're seriously planning for mining on Mars and the moon using this technology. Well, we are working towards that. <laughs> if you know how many minerals and resources are there, <laughs> you might want us to do that. <laughs> so you're talking about a lot of resources potentially. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, very, very rich. And asteroid as well, very, very rich. So what kind of different jobs would that kind of swarm robots do? So be involved in a different kind of excavation or exploration or what, what kind of different jobs would they do? Yeah, they would do different jobs. We can have specialized groups of swarm robots who would do special tasks and then communicate to each other. Some, for example, might go and look for resources. And when they find one, then they send a signal to those who are excavating and when they excavate, they can send a signal to those who are actually moving this to the place where it will be processed. Or we can have robots who are multitasking, but they can still be a swarm of robots who are multitasking. So that depends on the scale and on the tasks that we need to perform. So we can group them in different ways. So it means they can do these these activities in parallel through communication. Exactly. As well. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it is a really interesting area. And we we talk a lot now. You know, there's a lot of parallels in this. We talk about hive mind as well, don't yeah. we? Swarm robots, and so that opportunity, I think, to have individual specialists, but then with the communication piece, really then builds uh, that greater innovation and technology piece. Yes, and also for off-Earth mining applications on Earth, we can always maintain the machines and service those, but there we cannot. So if we are using swarm robots, then if one robot is faulty, the others will take on its tasks so the production can continue and we won't have problems in that aspect as well. So you're really designing a system from the start that's almost uh, autonomous. Uh, yes. It would be without people to start off with. Yes. The, the dream is you'd send the robots over, they'd build this wonderful place, this palace on Mars uh, that then... And then uh, we'd go there. The few could go to. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what about other examples of biomimicry? Because I think you work in some other areas as well, don't yeah, you? Yeah, we are working on a few interesting projects. The other one is on ventilation system for habitats on Moon, Mars, and other planets. Uh, because in those situations, we will need ventilation nonstop. We want to design a ventilation system that is not noisy, that is quiet, and it also doesn't blow air on people. It is comfortable. So we are trying to learn from nature what mechanisms are out there that we can borrow. So there are some insects who have very interesting breathing systems. So they have chambers where they keep air. There are some plants who have very interesting kind of mechanisms in them. So we are, at the moment, we are investigating them and trying to translate them into engineering design. Mm. So the idea is to have drivable walls, which can maintain clean and fresh air without all the inconveniences of active ventilation system that we generally have. Mm. That's true. I mean, I'm a biologist, so uh, <laughs> I'm quite interested in this. Uh, so insect and plant systems, often they have a, a passive kind of gas exchange uh, system that circulates carbon dioxide and oxygen and replaces those. So you're, you're seeking to basically mimic that passive exchange system rather than the active air conditioning systems that we so normally see. We how does that work with walls? How, does, uh, how do walls become then the kind of permeable entity oh, yeah. in that? They're, they're, the walls won't be the ordinary walls we have, they will have sections which are porous and which are made of like soft robots so they can actually mimic the breathing process. Mm, yeah. And we will, of, of course, this will be connected to the main ventilation ducting and for that we are looking at developing quiet fans which will be outside the building. So this clearly has applications off-world but probably also applications here on-world as Absolutely, well. Absolutely, yes. It's incredible to think that we can take the movement of swarming wasps, 
or the breeding mechanisms of insects and apply them to exploration, resource discovery, and perhaps even one day, habitation missions to Mars. Talking to Dr. Nune is a great reminder that when faced with unknown challenges in unknown environments, we can always turn to life in our own backyards for inspiration. While Dr. Nune's passion for biomimicry is forging a path towards the stars, another one of her research developments has the potential to drastically improve our lives right here on Earth, namely in the field of structural integrity and sensor technologies. But before we delve into the second area of Dr. Nune's research, I'm interested to find out what drew Nune to this field in the first place. How did you get into engineering? Because it's probably fair to say it's a male-dominated kind of area. And uh, what what excited you about engineering when when you started? I don't know. When I was little, I was always interested how things work. I would take into part a radio or whatever would get on my hand. So I think I was always excited about the creative aspect of engineering, Mm. that you create a world that doesn't exist. Mm. (laughs) Somebody said that. (laughs) (laughs) I just quote. And uh, yeah, that's how. But you are absolutely right, because when I got into civil and structural engineering as undergraduate and master's student, we had only four girls among 100 boys. And Four girls amongst yes. yeah. 100 boys. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And uh, when I did my PhD in Australia at the University of New South Wales, I and another lady who was an international student, we were the very first females to do PhD at the Australian University in Mining. Wow. <laughs> so I ended up being like the first Australian female <laughs> to get a PhD in mining. And, yeah. And she was the very first. But she was from overseas. Now, I so, won't ask you exactly how long ago that was because, uh, you know, uh, we shouldn't do that. But it wasn't that long ago. I mean, that's the uh, <laughs> the issue, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I got my degree in 2000. <laughs> but hasn't, much hasn't changed yet. No. Yeah. We still have few ladies doing yeah. PhD in mining. Look, I, I love that idea of creating a world that doesn't exist yet. It's just so powerful. And I think it also emphasizes the creative side of engineering and often we don't you know it's a bit like accountancy right we think that it's very much around formulas and maths and kind of boring application and it's not it's around you know really creating the the uh, the vision for the future yes and i actually i myself perceive engineering as like form of art Hmm. And I always tell to my students, you are artists. <laughs> you just happen to know maths. <laughs> but you must be artist first. <laughs> you must have imagination. Yeah. But another key aspect of your work is, uh, is around, you know, the application of sensor technologies here uh, on Earth. Yes. And how did you, how did you get into, into that area? When I was doing my PhD in mining, and uh, my PhD was about underground mines, stability of underground mines, and um, sudden gas in rushes in coal mines, which is a very serious problem leading to terrible disasters if it's not controlled. Australia is the fourth largest mining country in the world. And today, there are over 350 mining sites across the country. For decades, the mining and mineral export industry has been one of the largest pillars of our national economy, reaching 10% of our gross domestic product in 2020. And although this behemoth of an industry has come a long way since the days of the gold rush, health and safety remain at the core of its processes and operations, and for good reason. In 2006, Todd Russell and Brant Webb walked free after two weeks trapped underground in a rockfall that killed their co-worker Larry Knight. Now the mine itself is in mortal danger, with no rescue in sight. It was September 20, 1975, when the peaceful surrounds of Maurer were rocked by a violent explosion at the Kyanga mine. Thirteen men perished. Their bodies were never recovered. A central Queensland coal mine at a standstill. The only sign of activity, officials trying to determine what caused Queensland's latest mining tragedy. A mine will not open after a catastrophic event unless it can be demonstrated that it can be mined in future safely. A conference in Brisbane has been told a mine disaster like that which killed 29 workers in New Zealand could happen in Australia. 
Experts from across the globe have spent the day talking about the risks associated with extracting minerals from the earth and what can be done to maximise safety. It's research like Dr Nunes that aims to learn from past mining disasters, to develop technology to protect the 300,000 plus Australians who work in this industry today. And in talking to Dr Nune, I hear of the exciting and innovative ways in which she's approaching this important matter. I observe that it's a very serious issue monitoring such a large scale structure underground. And uh, some aspects were monitored just by visual inspection, because that seemed to be the best reliable way to do it, like activation, big falls, or condition of rock support bolts and stuff like that. So I thought then of designing a monitoring system that could monitor that kind of large-scale structure in a very short period of time and without interfering with the production. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing that was important. And then here came in my inspiration from my childhood, (laughs) because then I was little, uh, my mom was just starting her PhD, and she came home one day, also radiant, and she had this tiny cylinder, which was about 30 centimeters tall and about one and a half centimeters in diameter, and it had just two wires coming out of it. And uh, I was always fascinated how this radio talks because I was very little (laughs) and I took it apart and I saw it has some parts in it which make it talk. But then when she put these two wires into the socket of radio and this little cylinder started to talk, it was like (laughs) a magic to me. (laughs) Later I learned that it was a piezoceramic cylinder. And uh, I was fascinated about what you can do with that material and... uh, those sensors. So. Yeah. So a piezo ceramic cylinder. So yeah. what what exactly is piezo electronics or ceramics? Yeah. So these materials have polarized uh, molecules, and when you apply alternating current to them, they undergo mechanical vibrations. Or if you put them under mechanical deformation, then they generate electricity. That term is electromechanical coupling effect. And we use this to monitor the conditions of structures. So how, how exactly do you use it in, in the monitoring of structures? Do you, are the sensors uh, attached to walls yes. and then you, a current is applied? Or yes. Uh, yes. how exactly do you Yeah, they are attached that? to walls. Yeah. So our system allows to retrofit the sensors or they can be built into the structure if people want. And then we activate the sensor, giving them an electrical signal and then we are recording the waves that come back to us. So the advantage of our technology is that it can activate un- practically unlimited number of sensors given how many channels we give it and read all from all of them at the same time. Hmm. So this allows us to monitor large structures in less than a minute. You just have to put the sensors in place yes. and then yes. you can yes. and do you need baseline data or can you just oh, that's- uh, yeah. That's a very good professional question. <laughs> that's, that's actually the logic behind this technology. When you take the first reading where the condition is considered like it's good or it's a starting condition, that's our baseline reading, and yeah. every other reading is evaluated compared with that one. And then we put a threshold after which it means there is a damage going in. And when this threshold is exceeded, then that signal is indicative that there is a damage developing in the material around that signal, around that sensor. So the application for this technology must be significant. I mean, you could basically start monitoring the condition of any building or bridge. You know, from now you you would be able to track uh, a degradation of that building structure Absolutely over time true. from now. Yes. So you could start any time yes. with that. So do you have interest in uh, commercializing the, oh, yes. the technology? Yes, this technology, actually, you are absolutely right that we can monitor infrastructure, buildings. We can also monitor oil tankers, submarines. So it, it is very well applied to thin wall structures mm. as well as to stone structures, brick structures. Mm. So it has very, very wide applications. Uh, This technology, actually, we have been collaborating with innovation and commercial partners, and our project has been supported by them in recent years. And at this stage, we we are at a stage that we have two companies interested in commercializing our 
invention. So one of them is from Sydney and they are covering Australia and New Zealand. Mm. And the other one is from Queensland and they want worldwide lessons. So the first company has option agreement signed and the second one is currently working with innovation and commercial partners to actually sign a commercial license. Well, good luck with it because uh, I can see no reason why these sensors wouldn't be on every building and bridge in the world at some point. I think so too. Actually, another advantage maybe I want to mention of this kind of sensors is that you can manufacture them in any shape and size. Mm. So they won't, you know, make buildings look bad or you won't actually be able to figure out it's a sensor because they can be- go into the design and not interfere with looks. Imagine that, every building, bridge, mine and tunnel in the world, monitored and assessed 24-7 by smart sensors that are both discreet and effective at identifying structural faults before they become fatal infrastructure disasters. But how does Dr Nune see her research making an impact in 10 years' time? And how can her two passions of biomimicry and sensor technology be brought together? So, yeah, you should probably say thanks to your mum because from that it's kind of embarked you on a a lifelong mission, I guess, uh, in that area. But let's talk a a bit about legacy. So say say it's 10 years uh, Mm -hmm. ahead from from today and you're you're looking back. And from this point, you were given a very large grant, you know, millions of dollars uh, from the the Australian government to basically do whatever you wanted. Uh, What what would you have achieved? How would you have made history with with that, that resource? What could you do? Oh, oh, that's a wonderful question because there are so many things one wants to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I probably would continue research in biomimicry and also further advancing sensor technologies to make them more flexible maybe mm. so that they are not, maybe you don't have to attach them. They can go and attach to whatever you want them to go and touch, monitor and come back. Maybe that's a, that's a dream I have for sensors <laughs> to be like little swarm of insects go and monitor and come back. <laughs> so you combine your two passions. You yes. have uh, a swarm <laughs> of monitoring robots out there <laughs> checking the condition of all uh, all structures on yes. on Earth and off Earth as well. <laughs> yes, and off Earth as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can look forward to that in in ten years. Yeah, me too. I'm looking forward. Hopefully, I will have that money you mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> can do that. <laughs> we'll, start, we'll start working on that grant application right away. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> well, Nuna, it's been a, a fantastic and really fascinating uh, discussion today. Thank, Thank you. Thanks very much for being on the Discovery Pod. Thank you, Andy. It's great to talk to you today. I've taken so much from our discussion with Dr. Nune Malcumian, starting with the ways in which we can approach off-world challenges through biomimicry and finishing on the massive potential the smart sensor technology has to change the way we build, mine and live in our world. Thank you to Dr. Nune for sharing her research and story with us on the Discovery Pod today. And thanks as well to you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, leave a review. Rate us five stars. And while you're at it, why not share this episode with your friends and family? We'll be bringing you new and fascinating insights from the forefront of research and innovation every fortnight. So hit follow now to ensure you never miss an episode. Next week, Dr. Annalise Chabert talks to us about her field of One Health and how she plans to transform the way in which we detect new diseases quickly and reliably. Annalise and I had a great discussion that explored disease-sniffing dogs, electronic noses, and how new diseases are born and spread. It's one that you won't want to miss. In the meantime, if you have a topic you would like us to explore, get in touch at podcast at adelaide.edu.au. We'd love to hear from you. Until then, I'm Professor Andy Lowe, and you're listening to The Discovery Pod. 
brought to you by the University of Adelaide. So, what do you want to know next?